Hi, it's uh, Simon Clark, CEO from American Lithium um, in London for the RBC Battery Conference and had a great opportunity to come and uh, catch up with Matt and Tom and chat all things lithium. It, it, absolutely. I, I know you're being nice, but you're actually here for the Battery Conference, which is quite a big deal <laughs> in the industry and uh, a, few, a few big banks in there um, as well, obviously. So what we're hearing is the Battery Conferences around to the rafters, um, precious metal guys struggling to get the same kind of love at the moment. So what are you, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? And what do you want to get out of uh, your trip to London? Yeah, no, I listen, I, I, I think that is true. Um, you know, the battery metal space has been interesting. There's been a bit of a pullback in the, in the lithium price, um, which doesn't really seem to have anything to do with longer term supply demand fun, um, fundamentals. But I think it's giving people uh, a, an opportunity for a good entry point into a lot of plays. So, and you know, as I say, everyone knows that the long-term demand supply fundamentals are, are what they are, and we need to bring on new supply in all of these metals as quickly as possible. And and that hasn't changed and won't change. So, absolutely, lot, lots of interest, and I actually think even more so because I think the lithium price might have scared some people for a while there um you know and precious metals has had a little better bit better of a run up but you know i think uh people sort of question how long that'll last well, well fair enough um we got to talk about peru yeah okay and g given the projects that you've got you get a couple of big big assets in, in peru you know we've talked many times about potential spin outs and timings of that etc but what's happening in country any good news I believe so. I think actually really good news. Um, we've been in the press a few times, mentioned by the government. The, the mining minister has gone on record a number of times talking about their desire to really push um, mining. And in particular, he's mentioned, you know, 20% uh, growth in copper this year. They want to see, and they want to see lithium be developed as an in, a new industrial mineral in Peru. So those have been two really strong themes. We met with a bunch of the ministers around PDAC. They assured us that we'd start to see things move on our permits. And, um, you know, again, he went on record last week saying our permits are imminent and that's the news we're getting. So I think we will shortly finally get our broader drill permits for, you know, we're going to test some really interesting targets west of Falchani. We've always said we think there are other deposits on the plateau and then do a lot of infill and extension drilling around Falchani itself. Um, and that's over and above the work we're doing. I mean, the project's now well into PFS. As you know, we launched our uh, environmental impact assessment last year. We were doing a bunch of MET work. I continue to do that and refine the flow sheet. And, um, you know, we have been able to do some drilling through the, the, the whole EIA process. So, our steps this year are to get the PFS done by the end of the year uh, and in the interim as part of that process also update the old PA. Right, okay. Th those, those are your, your, your plans. I'm, yeah. I still want to stick with the jurisdictional component because sure. I think people looking in South America go, South America occasionally goes on South American time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've had lots of conversations about what new governments are doing and yeah. saying versus what actually happens. How is the U.S treating the relationships with Peru and you know it, it, any of that working in your favor um any of it can advance your interests yeah and apologies for my attention deficit there <laughs> I, I, I um yeah I should have rounded out the comments on the government I, I I mean I I think what you're seeing is you're seeing Peru return to what I would say normal it has one of the best fiscal codes one of the best mining codes in South America you, you know, mining is protected under the constitution. It can't be nationalized. And Peru has historically been a center-right country. Um, and although you have a, a left-leaning president who's come in as an interim president, she's had the foresight to bring in a, if you like, a government of unity across the spectrum and really focusing on, you know, I mean, a, a lot of the complaints that you've seen from some of the remote areas, including Puno, have been around jobs and the economy. And so they've got a big focus on re-energizing the economy, and a huge part of that is mining. And they seem to be um, really focusing on the, the mining minister has now said they've, you know, they've cleaned out the ministries and 
the, the, the mining sector is now back into a much more normal state. And we're certainly starting to see that. So I think, I think that is really positive. I think, you know, we could see a very stable um, government in place here for a couple of years before the term right. is up. And I think you've seen the US really embrace that as well. They've, right. they've started to become more active. I mean, uh, you know, I sort of, my, I met with both ambassadors of US and Canada in December. It was around about the time there was all this press about companies like us shouldn't be doing deals with the Chinese or bringing in Chinese investors. And I made the point to both, that is that is a half policy. If you're taking out the means to raise money or, or have an exit for junior companies, you need to help those companies replace that. And so with the US, the Inflation Reduction Act has the potential to apply to Peru. And you know I think the Canadian government needs to do something similar for companies in our position. And I also made the point that, you know, it's been a challenging political um, arena down there for 18 months or so. How about some help as we try to get our permits through the process? And, you know, the only permits that seem to be being granted are, you know, with Chinese companies and that sort of thing. And that was their own words. Um, and so since that time, they've been very active. I mean, we've always had a great relationship with the Canadian embassy. Now I think we have a really good one with the US embassy as well. And both seem to be very active pushing the agenda that we should get our permits and be allowed to fast track development. And it's, it's that's what we're doing. It's interesting actually, because the, the US, I guess, position themselves or see themselves as a buyer of critical minerals, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. They're trying to secure, get the, the, the critical mineral security there, but they're a buyer. Canada feels like a seller. So it feels like they're kind of they're behaving differently. So what 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 precisely do you want to see from the Canadian government in terms of the equivalent of a, of the IRA or other incentives for you guys when it's dealing with South American countries? Especially I agree. Well, I mean, I think I think Canada, you're right, is focusing more on being a supplier of critical minerals to the U.S. and the domestic supply chain. The U.S. is trying to secure supply wherever it can come from. So for U.S., the fact that China is taken over Africa for 20, 30 years and is now doing the same in South America, I think it's finally dawned on them that if they are going to get the critical minerals they need, they're not going to get it all from production in the US. It's got to be a concerted effort. Yeah. So I, I think for Canada, um, they are bringing in um, incentives, but it's mainly can Canadian centric. And and so again, I think I think what they could do is I'd like to see some of those applied to countries like us and companies like us. I mean, again, if you're shutting down a, a source of capital, and it's a tricky one because, you know, the, how do you stop Chinese funds out of Hong Kong or Singapore or wherever trading on the TSXV and public company stocks? So it, it's it, to, to, to me, I admire what they're trying to do because our vision is to supply the Western supply chain if we can. I mean, you know, ultimately you do the right thing for your shareholders and you get the best exit or the best return that you can. Um, but, you know, if you're going to do that, then you need to help politically in country and you need to help companies that need capital through the development cycle access that. It's, it's kind of interesting. Like, I, I agree with you with regards to the, the, the U.S., you know, having yeah. sort of gone into Africa, de dealing with benign dictators is a bit easier than dealing with um, those gosh darn uh, socialists. Uh, it seems, but Canada and South America kind of feel like they've kind of got the, this, the same sort of mentality when it comes to First Nations, local, and indigenous, EC, ESG, et cetera, et cetera. Is that helping at all? Is that message helping you? I Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. But I, but I, I also really think that the US has woken up and... And I think, I mean, the U.S. is obviously to to what aspect to, to, to the shortage of minerals, the shortage or to of the way minerals, to do business, the shortage of minerals, and the need to really help companies like us that can help them on that side. Right. And if you think about Peru, it's a natural ally of of the U.S. historically. Now, in recent years, you've started to see the Chinese come in, and with some of the left leading presidents we've seen, then there's been yeah, yeah there's been there's been a tie up with them. Um, with uh, you know, with some of the Chinese, but but you you have to remember, Peru is historically very much a center right country, com 
you know, country. And yes, there are left-wing factions that they've had to deal with. And, you know, but I think the, you know, I think in general, there is this historic relationship that runs pretty strong. And I think that was probably the same in certain countries in, in Africa. And the US maybe stood back too much, you know, maybe they didn't want to be accused of being too imperialist. But I do feel that they are making a concerted effort and, and in the right way, you know, they're not trying to run these countries, but they're very much standing up for, for companies like us and, you know, trying to make sure that there is a level playing field with how, how things are done. And I think that's, a, that's, a, that's only a positive. Right. Okay. So that's the, that's the jurisdictional component. So yeah. I spent a bit more time on it there, but I think it's going to be so... It, <laughs> It's much more important, it seems, to the investors. Certainly, for feedback, there's an understanding of how projects are being held up, why why there can be problems with certain jurisdictions, which have traditionally been, you know, good mining yeah. jurisdictions. So, um, Peru feels like it's back on track somewhat. That, that, that's my sense. Right. And, okay. And again, I think the the U.S. and Canadian governments are helping that process right. as so well. So, how does that convert into the time frame that you want to work to? Yeah, you you're still able to do stuff on the ground, are you? So, so we, I mean, we have a, you know, uh, Lawrence and Ted build a very strong team in Peru, which we inherited. Obviously, we, you know, we we have a few of our own nuances with that, but we fundamentally have a very strong Lima-based team and a very strong strong team on the ground in Puno. And, um, you know, I think, I think for us, they've managed to keep field work going. They, they launched the EIA, um, last year because it allowed us to, to, to do drilling, albeit hydrological focused up at Falchani. It allowed us to get the project moving on that side. In the background, obviously we've continued to refine the flow sheet with Ansto, you know, in terms of SOP and cesium as byproducts and and finalizing that whole overall flow sheet so that you know this year we've launched the PFS phase um, at, you know relatively aggressively and I think we're well advanced on the met side um, obviously what I want to see is um, our broader drill permits which we've had in the queue for two years again our senses were very close there and That'll be it. That'll really help us do the extension and infill drilling that still needs to be done at Falchani. When we acquired Falchani, one of the things that attracted us to it is it's a big resource, but it was, it's ultra conservative in terms of how the reserve auditor looked at it. And most of that is in indicated and inferred. So not only do I believe that resource gets a lot bigger, but as we move into feasibility, we need to obviously move a chunk of that into M&I, which then become your reserves. And so... You know, the drilling is a key component for that. And, um, you know, I really feel we're, we're going to be able to move that forward. Plus, there's always been this thesis that there are numerous lithium deposits on the Makassani Plateau. And now we're able to go and do some discovery drilling on those priority targets. I think there's really some potential for some very strong news there as well. well absolutely. Look, and you're well capitalized. You, you can go off and yeah. d do this, um, I guess, growth through the drill bit, yeah. component in terms of getting people to understand the scale of the opportunity in front of them. But here's the other thing I want to understand in terms of your balance sheet yeah. and decision making at board level, which is around um, what has the plan changed and evolved? We've seen a bit of MA in the space, not a lot. Some money coming in. There's probably a handful of companies you could say, well, actually, they've got a decent chunk of money into them. Um, a lot of chat, a lot of theory, a lot of hype, but not a lot of money flowing to some of these project, North American projects that we're yep. seeing at the moment. So in terms of the way that you play this and the way that you kind of mix up pretty for outside uh, voyeurs looking in at this thing, say, well, scale, scale is one thing and we'll go after grade and whatever we do with the drill bit, hopefully delivers on that front. But we've also seen a few companies destroy themselves by having to raise the capex for these large projects. And there's long fallow periods where the value just isn't there because people are waiting for the thing to you know, get nearer to production. So what's the intent from you? You've you talked about spin outs in the past. You've got Peru assets, yeah. you've got US assets. Yeah. There's a bunch of options on the table. So. Is the thinking changed? Um, not, not really. And, and I actually think we're executing on the strategy. Um, we would have done the spin-out by now if the market 
had right. been a, a little less volatile. I mean, um, you know, we wanted to do it in February, but obviously you had, you know, Silicon Valley Bank and then the dominoes fell and it's been a risk off market. Yeah. So it doesn't do any of our shareholders any good if we spin out the uranium, raise some money on it. Um, it's in its own vehicle ready to go and then it languishes below issue price, which most, you know, financings have done in recent yeah. times in the space. So we're just waiting for a little bit better market. Uranium remains strong, lots of interest. I mean, that is the biggest asset in South America. It's one of the biggest assets in the world. It's going to be a fantastic um, project. Uh, it is a fantastic project, but in its own vehicle, focused on uranium, focused on developing it, I think it's going to do really well. But, so that's, you, you know, talk, ready to go. Just waiting the for right the right moment. time. Yeah. yeah, you want to get maximized the value for that. Fair enough. Yep. What's come back to the idea of the plan? Yeah, you so, big so that then leaves us to focus on two world-class, large-scale lithium projects, which is a lot for any development company. Yeah. And you know, who knows how far we take one or both? Well, I, um, I want to know. <laughs> well, I, I'm all ears. Well, well, I mean, obviously, there's lots of moving parts, but but what we've done, and you've seen us do it, is we don't have any debt. We've bought back any royalties that we had. Um, we, because we're well capitalized and well funded, and I give a lot of praise to Andy Baring for that, um, we haven't had to give up offtake too early. We haven't had to do it to bring in cash or underpin anything. So we're clean. We've got a strong $40 million balance sheet. We don't have any offtakes. We don't have any royalties. We don't have any debt. So now's the time where, as we move through this year, we have a, a big PA out on TLC. We will be updating the PA at Falchani, you know, clearly, and both of that is as a move through pre-fees, which we're going to do aggressively. Clearly, the time is ripe now for right. strategic players looking at us for offtake, and we can do it yeah. without having to, we're not in a rush. We don't need to take an offtake for offtake sense because we want a name. We can do the right deal. There's lots of automakers and other OEMs who are interested. So I think as as a minimum, you'll see us go down that path as we move through the year of, you know, strategic relationship, probably related to offtake. As we go through that process, you know, does someone, you know, want to buy either asset? And then we focus on one or, or again, as we move through it, does someone want to buy the whole thing? I mean, you don't, you don't run your company so you can no. sell it. You build the team, but yeah. you, but we also recognize that lithium is a big boys game and these projects, there's a lot of capital needed as you move forward. So we're keeping our heads down. We're really good at finding stuff, um, developing it, taking it down the road. But at some point, you know, you're right. You, you, a company like us probably can't build two lithium mines. And so you have to, when is the right time to do things? So. You know, we're open to that as a first step, whether it's a strategic investment that, that, that then brings in the right partner. Right. I mean, you just have to look at the template now that is out there with with the Lithium Americas. You know, they're 18 months to two years ahead of us on the lithium, on the development cycle, 650 million from GM. Likely the US government will be funding the debt to build the mine. Ioneer, same thing, Sabonier, the equity partner, the DOE 700 million in debt to build the to, to build the mine, and that's even before they're permitted. You know, I and E is probably a year ahead of where we want to be. So there is a set path, and I think as lithium matures, you are also going to see the banks and other big players start to be prepared to 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 lend the money into the lithium space to build these big mines. Yeah. So you, you basically your message, I guess, is we're capitalized to move through the phases. We're At capitalized. all points along those phases, any competitive tension, very, very welcome. Yeah. Um, but you recognize you need a super large, crazy big balance sheet to actually get these things yeah. into production. Yeah. And that may not be the best idea for we're, you. We're well funded and we have the team that can certainly take right. this through pre fees and, yeah. you know, so into bankable fees. I mean, obviously, once you're there and you're you're permitting mines, you know, you, you have to bring in more people and project managers and a bunch of right. other stuff, which we're certainly prepared to do. And, you know, again, I think with Lawrence and Ted heading it, we have a, we have a, one of the better technical teams out there in the lithium space. Um, 
but of course, you, you know, we're not deluding ourselves. And uh, the, I think the key message I would give is because we have a strong balance sheet and we have enough capital for the next few phases, we're in the rush. So we're going to do the, the right strategic deals for this company as we move forward. Right. Okay. And um, I think the phases are, w- are well understood. Um, so we're not, not even going to go on, go into that one. Um, but just, just sticking with the kind of um, what you do with your assets in terms of M&A, whether someone comes in and looks at you, is there any intention of sort of looking around and seeing, looking at other assets yourselves, or is there enough to be done with the drill bit and the assets are big enough that you're... I, I, I think one of the criticisms that has probably rightly been labeled at us is that we are project rich. Um, and you, you know, as a young company, how can you handle three? So the spin out will help. Still, you've got two large lithium projects. I happen to think that the potential of each is, is, is very big. So yes, we're always interested in other projects um, and we would look at it, but it would have to be spectacular, spectacular for us to, to do that because, well, I, I mean, if we got a dollar to spend, why wouldn't we develop one of the best hard rock projects that I think there is on the planet or one of the best located projects there is in the planet in uh, in terms of a, a big project in Nevada. Right, and I imagine that over the next few days there's going to be lots of people trying to work out where you're at, what you've got, what your intention is uh, as well. So those conversations are happening for sure all the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk about something which is well, a byproduct. I was going to go non-core. It's a byproduct. Cesium. Yeah. People don't talk about it much, um, but the people who know get super, super excited. Yeah. How are you looking at cesium as, as part of the next for your story? Well, we think, I, I mean, obviously to date, we've just focused on the lithium side at Fox yeah. because that's been a strong enough story in its own right. Um, you know, and but the, I mean, the key byproducts, we, we have to take them out as part of the flow sheet anyway. You know, you have cesium, you ultimately have rubidium, you have potassium, which gives you SOP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So st- strategically, SOP is huge in Peru because they import pretty much all of their fertilizers. Right. A bunch of the, 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 the strife that was in Peru was because, you know, with the Russians invading Ukraine, they couldn't get the fertilizers that the agricultural se- sector needed and the prices went through the roof and people couldn't afford them. So Falchani gives Peru the potential to be self-sufficient in SOP. So there's a financial side to it, but very much a strategic side to it as well. Cesium is really interesting because like a lot of these um, critical minerals, it's dominated by the Chinese. And cesium is used in night vision and other specialty applications in the military. So there's a DOD element to it as well. And some of the, 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 there has been a big Western mine, I think that Albemarle was running that I think is now down to tailings and close to being finished. So uh, Falchani has one of the biggest, as far as we know, cesium resources on the planet, you know, lower grade. But I mean, certainly we believe that as we finalize the flow sheet, it will be a really meaningful byproduct. And uh, you you know, there's a two or three specialty traders and any ton you could produce of cesium, they'll take off your hand, they'll bite your hands off to get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it'll be meaningful dollar-wise. Is it? It's not meaningful volume-wise. That's the good news. Yeah, I, I mean, there'll be, it, it, it's a big asset. I mean, we, we, we so it's interesting. We see lower grade cesium with the lithium in the tooth and then the breccia um, underneath the tooth in terms of how it's mineralized is even more cesium rich. So, you know, again, it's identifying where the key, and we've only focused on the lower grade stuff in the tooth as part of the overall flow sheet. But I think Falchani has um, higher grade sections as well. It could be very meaningful as we evolve the cesium side. Okay, very, very interesting. And with regards to critical minerals for the US, I imagine the U- U- US um, Department of uh, yeah, you know, you know who. Yeah. Well, we'll be knocking on the door for that one. Look, I, I'm, like, I just want to catch up. Well, you're, you're in town. You're at this conference. Um, I'd love to hear from you after the conference and sort of see yep. what, what who, who rocked up. I saw, I saw the attendee list, but I want to see who actually showed yep. 
and what were they asking? Because that's it's a real kind of clue. The, 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 the industry is moving forward. The industry yes. is spending and blowing a lot of capital um, to, to, to advance their projects. Whatever our little tiny equities market is doing, the industry is getting on with it. So it'll be interesting to see what... Uh, well, you know, it's a fascinating world when you're seeing OEMs invest directly in mining projects. Yeah. And the DOE providing debt for mining projects, let alone a, a mining project that's not yet permitted. Yeah. So I, I think I think you're just seeing some incredible trends. I mean, I was at Benchmark in November in, in LA and one of the senior guys from GM basically said, there's no going back. We've bet the farm on EVs. Mm. And if if we can't get secured guaranteed supply, then we're toast. And and they, they don't have a choice, and they don't need the forty to eighty thousand tons that they might get from Thacker. They need hundreds of thousands of tons. Yeah, I think an interesting um, sort of again again just this step up and change in narrative was the EPA yeah. announcement last week. Obviously, um, if you think about two years ago, the statement from them was one third of U.S. cars and light vehicles will be electric yeah. by twenty fifty. I know. Now it's two thirds by twenty thirty two. I know. That's a massive shift and, and in I sentiment. And I saw a number of an additional 2.7 2.7 terawatt hours of batteries are going to be required between 2027 and 2032 to make that shift. It's, 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 it's nuts. Nice to be in the club, isn't it? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> unless you get kicked out. <laughs> well, I um, appreciate your time. We'll see you again soon.